Good morning. Thank you, Brock. That was wonderful. That just ended with this nice sense of peace that is exactly what I need at this moment. Welcome to all of you this morning who are here with us in worship, whether you're present here in the sanctuary or coming in electronically. We're so thankful that each and every one of you are here to join with us in worship. We have, you may have seen out on the, out on the sign that uh, today's um, a sermon title is Whose Power? And we have a powerful service for you today. I know that you will, will hear many, many inspirational things from, from today's service. So again, we're, we're glad you are here. I want to share with you a number of announcements of things that are happening, um, uh, the happening things here within the, the church family. Um, as I'm doing that, if you would please Pass the sign-in sheets um, down your pew so that all who are present can, can let us know in writing. If you happen to be a first-time guest, um, we ask that you, there's a, I think it's yellow sheet in there, um, if you will fill that out and give us contact information so that we can provide information for you for, um, about this church, and we hope that will be helpful to you. Several things to be aware of, um, and I'm going to go in chronological order. Um, many of, of our uh, folks are a part of the Bella Vista Men's and Women's Chorus, and there is a concert this afternoon at 3, a community church that will benefit Village House, so be aware of that. The Karen Share trailer will be in our upper parking lot tomorrow. Um, next Saturday, Vicki Hoy's service will be at 3 o'clock here in the sanctuary, and so um, uh, we, we pray that you will be with here at, with us as we celebrate Vicki Hoy's life um, with her family at that point. And next Sunday, a week from today, is UMW Sunday, and um, uh, the, we will have, it will be primarily, if not exclusively, women who will, so men, please come. We need, we need your presence. Um, uh, but they will be leading the service that day, and I have been asked to let you know that additional singers, uh, women of song, they are called, are requested to bolster the voice forces up here in the choir. So if you're able to help with that, see Judy Packard, who is sitting right over there. So do those things. Also, um, uh, as we do believe that spring is coming. Um, <laughs> Sometimes we're not quite sure, but we do believe that is happening, and we need a new gardener this summer. So if you are good with tending flowers, planting flowers, choosing flowers, making things be beautiful um, in the garden, we, uh, we ask you to talk to either MJ Ryan or talk to the office, um, and, uh, and we'll uh, help you with that. So let us pray. Holy and powerful God, we come to you this morning in worship, in praise, in awe of your power and your glory. And we ask that as you are with us here this morning, that you will show us your presence, that you will help us to hear your voice, and we will leave this place inspired by who you are and what you have come to bring to us. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen.
please join me in our call to worship as is printed in your bulletins this morning. How joyful it is to celebrate the good news of God's love. We are Darkness cannot claim us. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. Would you please turn and greet your neighbors in the peace of Christ? also printed in your bulletins and it's also in your hymnals, page 881. Please join me as we, we affirm our Christian faith together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. The third day he rose from the dead, he ascended into heaven, and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
that was fun to sing, too. <laughs> Our scripture reading this morning is Psalm 4. Listen to the word of God. Answer me when I call you, my righteous God. Give me relief from my distress. Have mercy on me and hear my prayer. How long will you people turn my glory into shame? How long will you love delusions and seek false gods? Know that the Lord has set apart his faithful servant for himself. The Lord hears when I call to him. Tremble and do not sin. When you are on your beds, search your hearts and be silent. Offer the sacrifices of the righteous and trust in the Lord. Many, Lord, are asking, who will bring us prosperity? Let the light of your face shine on us. Fill my heart with joy when their grain and new wine abound. In peace I will lie down and sleep, where you alone, Lord, make me dwell in safety. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks Thanks be to God. God. worship now continues as our ushers come forward to receive God's tithe in our offering.
praise, O oh Lord, these gifts which you have first given to us, and we would return to you. We ask that you would bless these gifts to the furthering of your kingdom. We pray that you would bless us all as your servants as we are sent forth. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. And Lizzie, I know you're out there. Would you like to come up and visit with me for a little bit? If there are any other children out there, I'd love to have them come forward. Oh, good. Good. Come up here, guys. Come have a seat beside me. There's two of you. Oh, that's awesome. So, well, I have a question for you. Have you ever been sick? Uh huh. Have you been sick? Uh huh. And and what happened when you were sick? Coughed a lot. You did. You coughed a lot. Oh dear. <laughs> he threw up out of his nose. Oh dear. <laughs> yeah, we still remember. It was a very traumatic experience, I'm sure. So what did? Maybe it was your mom, maybe it was your dad, maybe it was your grandma. What did somebody do to help? 
Uh huh. Did any of them help? And what did they do? They tried to help me not get sick. Okay, not get sick. Did they give you anything when you were sick? Mm -hmm. Uh huh. Like what? Sounds like they wanted to be my doctor. <laughs> well, toys sometimes make us feel better when we're sick. Mm -hmm. What about? Did they take you to the doctor? Maybe. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Did they take you to the doctor? No. Did they give you some medicine to make you not throw up? No, no. Well, sometimes, did they give you a hug? I bet they gave you a hug. Said, oh, I hope you feel better. Huh. Feel better That's right. We all feel better when we don't get sick. So let me ask you another question. Do you think that maybe God was there when you were sick? Yeah. Mm hmm Tell me about that. If God was there, how did that make you feel? That God gave you some penance as well. Made you feel good then, huh? Yeah. Well, I think we all need to remember that when we feel bad, when we feel sick, that God sends our moms and our dads and our grandmoms and whoever to help us feel better. And that God is always with us, helping us feel better. Okay? So let's pray about that. Pray with me. Dear God, Thank you for being with me when I'm sick and for helping me to remember that you're with me no matter what happens. With me no matter what happens. Amen. Good. Thank you. Thank you for coming up here. You can go back and We continue our worship by celebrating the joys that we have as a congregation as well as the concerns that we have as a congregation. Uh, the, the Pink Rose this morning uh, is in celebration of the birth of Addison Marie Mansfield on April the 2nd in New Elm, Texas. Uh, she's the great-granddaughter of John and Carol Zoom. Uh, Alan and Maxine Ward uh, made a donation to the prayer ministry in celebration of their 60th wedding anniversary, which is quite... That is certainly something to celebrate, for sure. On April the 12th is when that is. Uh, a donation's been made to the Habitat Faith Bill by uh, Burl and uh, Suzanne Shoemaker in celebration of their 65th wedding anniversary, which will be f uh, which was on Friday the 13th. Um, now, I'm stepping out of line here just a little bit. But I want you to know how proud I am that Jeannie is taking care of herself. Not all pastors do this. If, if you are sick, your ministry is sick. So I'm very happy that we can share as a joy the fact that Reverend Jeannie and Heath and Natalie are in Florida getting some much-needed rest. Uh, when she comes back, she'll be renewed, she'll be healthy, and so we're her ministry. So I'm very glad to see that she's taking care of herself the way preachers need to. Also, we have concerns that we share this morning as a congregation. Um, Alan Jensen, for our congregation, we need to remember in our prayers. Charlene Marshall, Ed Jenner, Tommy Runnels, Lois Yount, Yount, Charlene, and Johnny Rayburn. These are the, the, those that I've been made aware of. Are there other concerns that you would tell me about? If not, then let us do remember both these joys as well as these concerns as we go to the Lord in prayer together. Let us pray. Lord God, we do pray that you would not only hear our joys and the thanks that goes with the, those joys. We give you praise for the right decisions that we make when we allow ourselves to be in your hand that you will uplift us, you will heal us, you will restore and renew us. We also lift to you, Lord, these concerns, knowing that you are not only the great physician who heals us, but 
you are also emotionally a healer for us. Regardless of the concerns that we have as a congregation, we know and believe that you are with us, that you share our joys, you share our concerns, and therefore we place them before you, not only to unburden ourselves, Lord, but to bring about your presence, bring about your healing, bring about your blessing. And so for all these joys as well as these concerns, we pray the prayer that your son Jesus Christ taught us to pray. As we pray, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Isn't God's power in nature just totally amazing? I love those videos. Before I start the message, I'd like to, um, to do something I was remiss about at the beginning. I should have mentioned that Reverend Jim Rowland, who's a retired Methodist elder, um, would be assisting today, and he's done a wonderful job. I'm so glad that we had the opportunity for him to be a part of our worship today, too. So let me ask you, when it comes to, to the word power, what do you think of? Well, as I reflected on it and thought about power in our earthly culture, there were several things that came to mind. One of them I failed, so it was brought, came to mind, but brought up this morning, and that's power aid. How many people know what power aid is? Comes in a bottle, got power in them. And that would have been beautiful for me to have this morning so I could have something to hold on to and give me some extra power. But I'm going to use water instead this morning because there's a lot to say. 
We've got a lot of different powerful things, powerful things in our culture. We can think about our power, electric power, that comes from the wall, but really comes from the power grid that's up across our country. We can think of um, the power structures within our culture, the power structures that um, allow um, uh, one person to have power over another or structures that give power to benefit one group but not necessarily others. And then we can think about military power, the kind that countries use to show power one over the other, hopefully bringing justice where there is injustice, but it's always complicated. And certainly we've had an example of that just in the last couple of days with the bombing of Syria, but we won't go there this morning. So there's a lot of different kinds of power within our culture, but that's not the kind of power that we're going to talk about today. Today we're going to focus on a different kind of power. And I left my Bible. It's not a good thing. Don't leave your Bible whatever you do. We're going to talk about a different kind of power, and the, the uh, scripture that we will use is from the book of Acts, chapter 3. The specific scripture we're going to use um, are the verses 12 through 19, but I want to read a little before that so that you can get the, uh, the idea of what's been going on when these, these um, specific ones begin. One day at 3 o'clock in the afternoon, Peter and John were on their way into the temple for prayer meeting. At that same time, there was a man crippled from birth being carried up. Every day he was set down at the temple gate, the one called Beautiful, to beg from those going into the temple. And when he saw Peter and John about to enter the temple, he asked for a handout. And Peter, with John at his side, looked him straight in the eye and said, Look here. And so he looked up, expecting to get something from them. But Peter said, I don't have a nickel to my name, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, walk. He grabbed him by the right hand and pulled him up, and in an instant his feet and ankles became firm, and he jumped to his feet and he walked. The man went into the temple with them, walking back and forth, dancing and praising God. Everybody there saw him walking around and praising God, and they recognized him as the one who had sat begging at the temple's gate, and rub, they rubbing their eyes astonished, scarcely believing what they had seen. When Peter saw that he had a congregation, he addressed the people. O oh, Israelites, why does this take you by some such complete surprise? And why stare at us as if our power or piety made him walk? The God of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, the God of our ancestors, has glorified his son Jesus Christ, the very one that Pilate called innocent, but you repudiated. You repudiated repudiated the Holy One, the Just One, and asked for a murderer in his place. You no sooner killed the author of life that God raised him from the dead, and we are the witnesses to that. Faith in Jesus' name put this man, whose condition you know so very well, on his feet. Yes, faith, and nothing but faith, put this man healed and whole right before your eyes. And now, friends, I know you had no idea what you were doing when you killed Jesus, and neither did your leaders, but God, who through the preaching of all the prophets had said all along that his Messiah would be killed. He knew exactly what you were doing and used it to fulfill his plan. Now it's time to change your ways. Turn to face God so he can wipe away your sins, pour out showers of blessing to refresh you and send you the Messiah he prepared for you, namely Jesus. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Amen.
Peter says it wasn't his own power, it was God's power that healed the man who was lame. So the next question is, okay, in today's world, where might we see God's power? Many of us can see God's power in nature, like we saw in the video of the butterflies, or in the power of a thunderstorm, or the setting of the sun. We can imagine God's power when we see electrical power that's harnessed from sun or wind. But when we reflect on the power of the Holy Spirit or the power of the cross, we as human beings who exist in a material world, who like to touch and see and understand what's going on, have a hard time seeing God's hand at work in our world today. We have been privileged to hear many faith stories over the past several months. Each story has been unique and powerful in its own way, filled with wisdom and inspiration. And today, we have a story to share. India Height, who's in this beautiful picture, has agreed to share her story with us today. Now, India worships in the well, and um, she has time constraints and a family and nerves in front of the camera, so she's asked me to share this story with you, and it is a privilege to do so. You may have seen India and her husband, Kevin, along with their daughters, Emery, who's 11, and Landry, who's 5, worshiping this past year in the well service. You may have further found yourself wondering what happened to her that caused her to be missing both her hands and her feet. And she agreed to share that story with us today. It is one that brings her great joy, but still fills her with sadness and overwhelming emotion as she remembers those days. I'm going to tell the story in her voice. You need to hear this as if she were standing here at this very moment. She says, My story begins on March the 9th, 2016. It began as a normal day, much like any other. I was up at 4.30 to start work in my home office, auditing patient accounts for billing accuracies for my company, which provides medical billing for outpatient surgery centers throughout the United States. I had gotten Emory off to school and Kevin off to work, and it was just Landry and me to focus on our usual day-to-day -day activities. When Emery arrived home from school, the three of us loaded up the van and took her to have initial evaluations at a new therapy clinic opening in Bentonville. You see, Emery has Down syndrome. As I got in the van to head home from those evaluations, I immediately started feeling achy and like I was coming down with the flu. So as I started to feel worse and worse, I called Kevin and begged him not to stay late, telling him I thought I was coming down with the flu and feeling so bad I wasn't even sure that I could drive home. But miraculously, I did make it home. And by the time Kevin got there, I was feeling so bad I couldn't even give the girls their baths. Somehow, I managed to get dinner on the table for the three of them, and then I retreated back to our bedroom and crawled into bed shivering like I had never shivered before. Kevin was left to fend with the rest of the nighttime routine. I think I may have helped to do a few things to get the girls to bed, but all I could do, all I could think about was getting into a hot, hot tub because I was so very cold. I remembered shaking so fiercely I could barely get out of the tub and wondered what strain of flu had hit me so hard. I bundled up like I was in Siberia, as I continued to violently shake, I just could not get warm. It was a very rough night. Several times throughout the night, Kevin would ask me if I needed to go to the ER, and every time I would decline, <laughs> saying how we hadn't even met our deductible and I wasn't going to rack up a ton of medical bills that we could not afford when I only had the flu. And that was a, uh, a hazard of having done medical billing for so many years. 
I said I would just wait and go to urgent care in the morning or my own doctor. I was up that night several times throwing up and at one point woke a little too late and was trying to make to the bathroom on time and I tried to hold it in. But what I didn't know was that by doing that, it had caused me to aspirate. It got into my lungs and subsequently caused me to get pneumonia. We would learn about that later. I barely remember my alarm going off at 4.30 and I don't recall turning it off. But the next thing I do remember was Kevin asking me if I could get up and fix Emery's hair for school. So I fixed both girls' hair and then I stumbled back to bed before he left for work a little later at 7, I vaguely remember him saying that he would call and check on me in a little bit. And so at 10, when I neither answered my cell phone nor our landline, he thought perhaps I was feeling better and was in the shower. But when I didn't call him back within 15 minutes, which I always was good about doing, he instantly knew that something was not right. And so 20 minutes later, he arrived home to find me incoherent. I was so weak and delirious that I felt like my mind was in and out of consciousness. He immediately took me to the emergency room at Mercy here in Bella Vista. I remember that our pastor at the time, his wife and my friend, who was the children's ministry coordinator, were there at some point, and they were all praying over me. And the girls were sobbing almost hysterically. I remember telling my friend that it was okay. I just had the flu and not to cry. But what no one was telling me was that I was dying. Somehow, I had contracted E. coli and I was in septic shock. The prognosis was very grim. They could not find the source of the infection, and to this day, it still remains a mystery. They needed to get me to Mercy Hospital in Rogers, but they couldn't do it until I was stabilized. But my body was not cooperating. So finally, a decision was made to get the helicopter there. Yes, I was so sick that they did not think I could survive the 12-minute drive by ambulance from the clinic to Mercy Hospital. The very last thing I remember was being loaded onto the helicopter, and then I don't really recall much until 10 days later on March the 20th when they were getting ready to extubate me. I really had no idea all that had transpired in my 10-day hiatus, but Kevin did a wonderful job of explaining all that had happened to me. He told me that I had gone into septic shock, which basically means infection had hijacked my body and was in my blood, and that it was very, very bad. Because the doctors could not pinpoint the source of the infection, they were having a hard time healing it. They had tried every drug under the sun, but my white count kept climbing astronomically, and as a result, I had died not once, but three times, including suffering a heart attack. They did everything possible to keep me alive, and as a result of some of the medications I was given to keep my vital organs functioning, the, the blood flow to my hands and my feet was compromised, and they began to die. He went on to tell me that because they weren't sure at that point if those had become infected too and could be potentially what was driving the infection up, a decision was made to amputate. My hands were the first to go on March 15th, followed by my feet on March the 17th. He then told me that because my whole body was shutting down, that my kidneys were also failing, and I had been placed on dialysis. He proceeded to tell me how after suffering the heart attack, my cardiologist told him there was nothing that he could do and that everyone should just say their goodbyes. My family asked that they wait to remove me from life support until my brother and his family could get there to say goodbye. So Kevin told me 
that he was sitting there by my side, trying to process all that was about to happen, that they were about to remove me from life support. And at that moment, one of my three critical care doctors came in. Apparently there had been some confusion about what the next step should be, and this doctor was not ready to give up on me yet. And boy, am I glad that he didn't. As you can imagine, there was a lot of concern about my brain function after having died not once, but a total of three times. And while I am happy to say that on that March 20th, my dad's birthday, by the way, the day they decided to bring me out of the medically induced coma so they could see where things stood, the first words out of my mouth to Kevin were, <laughs> Go get me a McDonald's sweet tea, followed by, where is my phone? There were no sweeter words that had ever been heard than those. I remember my dad saying that just hearing my voice was the best birthday present he had ever received. After seeing my immediate family, I had an onslaught of visitors coming through my door to witness the miracle that had played out before them the past 10 days, including my two childhood BFFs, best friend forever. Thank you. <laughs> I was kind of explained it to you, and I couldn't even get it out. <clears throat> and with them, I began regaling them with memories from junior high and high school that even they had forgotten about. There was nothing wrong with my brain function and my memories were very much intact. Now realize, I still have a long way to go. As between the hospital and rehab, I had gone from, I was gone from my girls for a total of 83 days. And let me tell you that this woman is super mom and so devoted to her children and her husband, that that 83 days were painful to her. Every time we thought I was ready to leave the hospital to go to rehab, a new problem would crop up, including my resting heart rate that was way too high. So, so a solution to that was a pacemaker defibrillator combo. So I now sport one of those too. And it seemed like one thing after another kept going wrong. But miraculously, my attitude remained mostly positive. I did have my days, however, that I questioned God and God's purpose. Overall, I think the reason I never went into a downward spiral was because I was just so grateful to be alive. I had to learn to trust that God had a plan and to learn that for once, I could not be in control. Through my long ordeal, Kevin used my Facebook page to post updates. My story had spread rampantly, and everyone was sharing and praying. To give you some perspective, the executive director of the Down Syndrome Guild in Kansas City sprang into action and was doing everything she could to help. She did the coolest thing I'd ever seen. She started a prayer map. So anyone who had prayed for me could register it in Facebook, and it would then drop a pin on the map for their location. In the first 24 hours, over 3,200 pins in pretty much every state in the U.S. and a number of countries have been dropped. <laughs> Kevin often jokes that the reason I lived is that God was tired of being bombarded with so many prayers asking for my healing. I've tried to paint the picture of how gravely ill I was so that you can put into full perspective what a true miracle it was that I survived. My body was so sick that even my hair fell out. I credit three things with my survival. First and foremost, our Heavenly Father, who is the greatest physician and healer. Second, my amazing doctors and nurses who I staunchly believe were working through God, and thirdly, my love for Kevin and the girls. I get extremely tickled and emotional even now when I'm told the story of how they were trying to bring me out of the coma 
And so for incentive, Kevin started playing videos of the girls. I guess I became extremely excitable and started trying to reach toward the sound of their voices. My friend who witnessed this said she knew I loved my girls, but seeing me unconscious and so terribly sick, but at the same time so drawn to the sound of their voices, she was totally overwhelmed by my love for them. You might ask me how I can be certain that my medical team was working through the Holy Spirit. Well, I'll tell you. At one point, my lung collapsed because of pneumonia, and it was filling with fluid, and I was trying to, do to die yet again. No one knew what was happening, but they did know that I was crashing, and one of my critical care doctors rushed in and instantly stuck a chest tube in, and it started drain draining the fluids off my lungs. I was back again. When asked how he knew to do that, he said he didn't really know. He just felt something come over him, and he just started doing without even thinking. To me, that was God working through him. And then at my first follow-up visit with that critical care doctor who refused to give up on me, I was humbly crying before him and thanking him profusely for helping to keep me alive. And he looked at me and said, sometimes science and medicine can only do so much. Then when we can't explain how the healing happens, that's when you know there is a higher power at work. He felt it too. I believe they all did. I've had a long road these past two years to get to where I am today, and my journey is not yet over. I still have many things to conquer, but I'm doing so many things everyone thought I'd never do again, like cooking and baking, doing dishes, laundry, and even driving. I really do love proving people wrong. I get tired easily and frustrated because it takes me three times as long to do things. But for the most part, our life is pretty much back to the way it was before. I'll never ever be able to repay all the thousands of people who helped out in some way. I'm extremely humbled and grateful at the outpouring of support I received. I am most thankful, however, for all the prayers that were prayed for me because I am living proof that the power of prayer works. Sometimes I still question why this had to happen to me. Didn't I already have enough on my plate taking care of my daughter with special needs? Why do my girls have to be put through seeing their mom struggle every day and be deformed? So many thoughts like this have consumed me at one point or another and then Last year, at about this time, I was in a women's Bible study. We were studying the seven I am statements of Jesus. These are in the Gospel of John. It was the week we were studying the I am, the resurrection, and the life. That statement, that we were to read John 11, verses 1 through 27. That tells the story of how Jesus brought Lazarus back to life. I came to verse 4, and it was like a lightning bolt had struck me. That verse says, When Jesus heard this, he said, This sickness will not end in death. No, it is for God's glory, so that God's Son may be glorified through it. And I knew that's it. This is why this happened to me, so that I may live and share with others my story of how I miraculously lived, and it was all because of the healing from our blessed Father. Someone once said to me, boy, we are so glad he chose you to be one of his miracles and that we got to witness it, but it surely must be hard that God chose you. And she is so right. I am so thankful that God chose me. I am alive, 
I am lucky and I get to renew other people's faith and lead them to the Lord. And that is really what matters. Kevin figures with statistic that at the onset of my illness, up until the time I got to the ER, I had a 12% chance of surviving. So now I ask you, after hearing my story, whose power? Please pray with me. Holy and life-giving God, what an amazing God you are. What an amazing story India has shared. We give you thanks that you are alive and active in our lives, that you are present even when we may not see it or understand it. Lord, forgive us when we are skeptical. Forgive us when we try to explain it as being about our power and we refuse to believe that your power has been at work here. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your life-giving power that comes in so many different forms, in so many different stories, and in so many different kinds of healing. Sometimes when we are in the midst of life's troubles or when healing does not come as we think it should, we think, that maybe we don't have enough faith for you to heal us, or that you have forgotten us, or that you are punishing us. Lord, help us to see that your power is far greater than these thoughts. Help us to see instead that you are there for us, walking with us through all of our troubles. Thank you for the message of the cross, the message that tells us that you too have experienced pain, that you know what earthly struggles are like. Help us to know that even through this world, and even that in this world, there may, the, the world may only see death and despair. But in your gift to us, the storm clouds part, and there is healing in you. In you, there is life and resurrection, even through the worst of circumstances. Thank you, Lord, for who you are and for all that you came to bring to this world. We pray all this in Jesus' name. Amen. And now, as we stand to sing our final hymn, you are invited. You're invited to come to the altar to pray. You're invited to thank the Lord for his power as it works in this world. You are invited to join this church congregation and become a part of who we are. And you are invited to stand and sing together our final hymn. Let's just do the first verse. I think we're running over. And the final hymn is number 98, God Be the Glory. So I ask you, to who does the glory go? Whose power is at work? Great things our God has done. Go into the world and share that good news with all that you meet. In Christ's name, amen. <laughs>